nothing makes sense. But then there's a purpose for what you're going through. But then for that purpose to be revealed, we have to be willing to go through the process. Because if you, when gold, when, when you have gold, it comes out. It's not pure. It's not refined. It's rough and it has all these things. But then for, gold, for us to get the gold that we, we so much appreciate, it has to go through the fire. And so we're, we're okay going to the, 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 the jewelry place. We're okay going to the places and admiring all these beautiful things that gold is made of. But then do you ever stop to wonder, what did it take for this gold to come out like this? See, when we see Pastor Jeff, like here, you know, ministering, and we see, like, you know, people of God that we admire, we see the end results. We see the product. But then if you were to ask him, Pastor Jeff, what did it take you? See, because we, we always want to admire the end product, but then we don't want to admire the process. Amen? Because in, in, in this generation, in, the, in, in our times where everything is all like about fast food and about just going online and typing in the website and just being able to get to whatever we, we need to get to. I mean, I remember the days of dial-up. Anybody, right? The days of dial-up where it took forever. But then now, you know, with all this speed and now we're talking about 5G and all these things happening, it's like the more technology advances, the more we become impatient as a people. And so, we like to see the end result of how far God has brought people. But then to understand the process, because the process is not fun. If God were to tell you that for work, that the visions that I've been showing you, the things that I, I've, I've, I've been speaking over your life, this is what is going to take you. A lot of us would not want that. And so we go through the process, and then from the process, we get to the purpose. Why is God allowing this thing to happen? Why is my family going through so much chaos? Why is my body being afflicted? Why is it that I just cannot keep a job? Why is it that my boss and my coworkers and all these people are, 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 are coming against me? But then it's not just about the process. God also has a purpose for what you're going through. And so when we're going through it, instead of being fo uh, focusing on what we're going through, we need to ask God, why? What, 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 do you, what do you have in this moment to teach me? What are you trying to teach me in this moment? And so God will bring us through that process First of all, for his own namesake. Because God is a jealous God, and he will share his glory with no man. God is not a God to, because the thing, the thing with us is like, if God does not allow these things to happen to us, we become prideful and we start to boast. We boast of the things that we have. We boast of our kids, you know, being all perfect. If you've, if you've never been a mother or, or, or a father whose son or daughter has gone wayward, you look at other parents and you begin to point fingers. Because you don't understand the battle that you're fighting. You don't understand it. And so we look at people and then our judgmental selves begin to come out. Because we don't understand that the battle that you're fighting is not your battle. Everybody's battle is different. And so maybe instead of you pointing fingers, maybe instead of you being judgmental, maybe instead of you gossiping, maybe instead of you talking about people, maybe why, why don't you say, hey, my sister, hey, my brother, what can I do with you? Can I stand with you in this, in this, in this process? Can I stand with you in the storms? See, it is not for you to understand people's battles. That's not your job. I mean... I, I can guarantee you, you, have, you probably have more than enough to fight yourself. <laughs> Amen? And so we have to ask, ask God, what is, what, what is the point? What is the purpose 
for this pain? Why did I have to go through this process? That God would do it for his own name's sake. See, God will let us go through the process to build character and endurance. Because he said that when you have been refined, he didn't say when I just magically turn you into gold. He said when you have been refined, when you have been through the fire and the pruning process have, uh, has happened, when you've been through the process, when the fire comes and it's against the gold, uh, but then initially when the gold gets into, uh, through the fire, it's rough, it's dirty, but then God has to strip away all those things, the things that we so dearly hold on to, the things that have become idols in our lives. God has to get us to the point where he strips us of everything. And then we get to the point where it's like all of him and none of us. Because when God has brought you through the process, you cannot say that I did this. It's only going to take God to bring us through that process. Because I, I look back at my life. My dad passed away when I think I was about seven. Christmas Eve. The day before Christmas. So Christmas is just never the same. My mom was only 30 years old, five kids. In fact, my, the, the last, my last one, the, the last one, Elizabeth, she was only 40 days old, 40 days when dad passed away. And he passed away, got hit, you know, was it a, in the car accident, was really bad. They took him to OR, just, just too bad. So he passed away. Mom had a middle school education, nobody to help out. And, you know, you had thrown out of the, the house that we, we used to live in because that was my grandfather's house. So when my dad died, like, family was like, well, we, you guys, bye, adios. <laughs> and so in the chaos of all of that, see, the statistics tells you that a single mother with five kids, somebody is bound to be a drug addict. The statistic says that a single mother with five kids Going to college is not an option because you only have a middle school education. So the, the, the deck was stacked in, against us. But God. Amen? But God. Because God has to take you through that process that when you come out on the other side, you cannot boast. And we did not know where life was going to take us. But then I had a mother who was a praying mother. See, my mom did not have money. She did not have the education. She didn't have the connections and the networks. But there's one thing that she had. It was the power of her knees to be able to go down on her knees. And this is the testimony that we have. That five kids, every single one of us went through college. Every single one of us are serving the Lord. And not one of us went wayward. Not one of us went wayward. But you ask my mother, the process was not, was not fun. Raising five kids with no help. 30 years old. I mean, some of us are 30 and we don't want to get, get married. <laughs> Some of us get married and we're like, ah, uh, no kids. <laughs> Not now. I want to have fun. But 30 years old. Had to endure. See, and so now what the statistics and the books said, what the research said that this cannot happen. This is impossible. At least one of them has to be wayward. But God. Because he has to bring you through that storm. He has to bring you through that thing. So when you come out on the other side, all glory goes to him. You can't say that it was my job. No. You can't say it was because I, I'm the most, like, you know, prettiest girl in the world. No. You can't, you can't boast because God has a funny way of stripping us of everything. I'm currently, like, you know, working on an internship at the NIH. 
And I remember, like, my previous job, been there nine years, no promotion. Nine good years, no promotion. They bring people for me to train them, and they become leads. And then I'm like, what about me? They're like, ah, we don't think you're good enough. Over and over and over and over again. In fact, I literally, the other, the, the other day I was just thinking about it, and I had trained literally more than two-thirds of the people in my department. And yet, you're not good enough. I wanted to go to grad school. Ask my director, hey, do you mind giving me a recommendation letter? He's like, uh, I don't think you're a grad school material. I think you should just focus on working. Nine years for this guy. No. And then my coworkers, like, God, it's like one after the other. It's like the storm just like kept, it just kept hitting. One after the other. They would just go fabricate stories. Just fabricate stories. And literally, I, I, like, I was having, like, nightmares. Because, like, every time you go to work, it's like something new. Every time there's, like, something new is coming up. And you're like, God, when is this going to end? It's like, what is going on? So I decided to go and, like, you know, find other people, you know. And then I got a recommendation letter. So I got into uh, George Washington University to do my master's in data science. Thank God. So I, got, I, I get there, but then my undergrad, you know, I've been working in the, in the chemistry lab. I, I was working as a chemist, working in the chemistry lab. And then now I'm doing data science. And I'm like, God, I mean, you know what? Forget about all this chemistry stuff. Now, you know, data science, I heard people are making a lot of money from it. So I just want to do data science. And then I'm like, why would I go from chemistry to data science? It makes no sense. It's just like, what is going on? And then early this year, I got an email from um, my program director. He's like, hey, the NIH came to us, and they want a student from our program. But then they don't want any, just any student. They want a student who has a background in chemistry and who is currently in the data science program. <laughs> 15 students in the entire of the United States for that data science program. See, this is what God does, because I did not ap apply for that program. They said, we want this particular student. God made that role for me. I got to the NIH, and then I, I met up with my mentor, and I'm like, look, I was curious. Like, how did you come to select me? He's like, I was looking for a specific person. And I, when I saw your resume, I was like, I want him. This is the person that I want. I get there. I get there, they put all the interns together in one room. My mentor takes me up to the facility guy. He's like, this is a special intern. He needs his own office. Okay? Yeah. See, all the interns are squished in one room, you know, all of them, like this tiny little room, they're all squished in there, and they're like, he needs his own office. See, God will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Because you may not understand why God is taking you there. I thought I was, my chemistry was wasted. I thought I wouldn't have to need it anymore. But then God had a plan for me. He got this. People looked at you. In fact, my co-workers would get together and they would laugh at me. Because they did not understand the process. They did not understand that what I was going through, that was not the end of the story. It was part of the journey. Because if God had not brought me through that, I will be sitting in that office at the NIH telling myself, look at what Sam did. Oh, look at him. He is so smart. Look at him. But then when you know that for nine years, nothing happened for you. When you know that you sat there for nine years, you gave your all. Because God had to use that moment to build character and endurance. So when I get there, I can look back and say, but God. Yeah. You know, I used, I used to go to another church before I came here. And it's like all this chaos, all this chaos, just chaos after chaos. And it's like, you know what? I just want to just leave everything and just go away. 
just go away. I don't care about preaching, none of that stuff. I don't, I don't want it. And then I came to Ashburn. I don't know why we came to Ashburn of all places. I just happened that I happened to be in Ashburn. <laughs> then I came to Ashburn, and then I was looking for, I mean, I didn't want to go to church, so I was just home. And then at some point, I'm like, you know what? I think at some point, at least, I need to start going to church. So that was when I was, like, looking up churches, found Word of Life on YouTube, saw Pastor Yao preaching, and God bless him. God bless him. Amen. God bless his family. Father, we pray for Sister Nova. We pray for your family right now. We speak life over them, Lord. That, Father, even in, even in death, Lord, you can use his testimony. You can use his life to bless us, Lord. Amen. Because it took, when I saw him ministering, I was like, I want to go to that church. And I came to this church. Came to this church and is like still confused, you know, depressed, everything. And I remember like, you know, speaking to Pastor Jeff and I was like, Pastor Jeff, like, you know, it's like I need help because things are just not going right. See, I was broke. I didn't know how to manage my finances. And Pastor Jeff was like, hey, we're doing this financial peace university class, you know, if you don't mind, the Ramsey class. And I got taught finances, how to handle money, how to get out of debt by Pastor Jeff. And then it got to the point, I think I, I shared this testimony before, and then I've, I've shared with some people too. It got to the point where it's like, I was like, God, nobody in my family, well, at least in my immediate family, has been able to buy a house, and I want to buy a house. But then I, I felt this, I felt the weight of God. It's like, God, I want to buy a house, not just anywhere, but in Ashburn. And if you try to buy a house in Ashburn, you know, it's, yeah, you have to cough up a lot of money. So I was like, you know, I'm just going to trust God that God will do it. We, went, we, go, we go over, and then we're like, we want to buy a new house. We want to buy a new house. They said, you need to put down $75,000. For, you, for your, the income that you're making, you need to put down this money before you'll be able to qualify for the loan for this house. And then I was like, you know, I went, I, I went into my bank account, and I was like, yes, $75,000. We can do this. $3,500 in my bank account, trying to buy a $75,000 house. And we had eight months to try to come up with the money. And so I just started believing God. I was like, God, I'm just going to just let you handle this process. Because if it's your will for us to have this house, you will make a way for it. So back to my job. So when you work... For, uh, when you come in, you come in as a trainee. And then after a year, you get, you get you know, pushed to um, a, a technologist one. So that was, that was supposed to happen. Like, you don't need, it's not a promotion. It's just what happens, right? Most jobs, you go in as a trainee. After one year or two years, it's set. You just move on to the next level. I moved on. They gave me the title, but not the, the money. <laughs> Five years. Fighting with these people. <laughs> They're like, nope. We don't owe you any money. And then just when we needed $75,000 to put down on the down payment, my supervisor comes to me. Hey, Sam, we went back and we looked. Yeah, you're right. We, we, we were supposed to give you this money. So guess what? We're going to give you back pay. But God. See, when you're going through that process, this is me. Mad furious. What is going on with me, God? How come everybody is getting this money but, I, but, but me? Because God knew, because mind you, this is before Pastor Jeff taught me about financial management. So God knew that there's certain things that I need you to understand before I release this money to you. And, and if they had given me the money, guess what I would have done with it? Nothing. But then God knew that, look, you're going to need this money to buy a house later. So Guess what? They're just saving the money for you. <laughs> ah, but God, but God. See, they, 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 they thought that they were holding on this to punish me. But little did they, did they know that God was using them as my bank. We get this back pay. So we're sitting in the office with a sales lady, and she's like, I don't know, but I feel like 
something is telling me we should do something for you. Let me go talk to my manager and see what we can do for you guys. She comes back, $5,000 check. But God, I'm sitting in my living room watching TV, see this ad. This guy, realtor, comes on. He's like, hey, by the way, call me if you want to buy a house. We give you back uh, 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 2%. And I've never heard that. Well, I talked to someone. Someone's like, oh, yeah, all the Indians know that. <laughs> He's like, yo, lady, we know this. <laughs> I was like, sorry, I didn't know that. <laughs> but yeah. So I'm sitting there watch, watching TV. See, God has a way that even when you're not hip with the people who know that, that know how, he can still give you the knowledge without having the connections. Amen? So I'm sitting there in my living room watching TV, and then this ad comes on. This guy is like, call me if you want to buy a house, give you money back. I was like, uh, no. These people, they might be fraud. But then the Holy Spirit just kept, like, hitting at me. So I'm sitting in my car. I call this guy. He's like, yeah, go to the office. Tell, tell them about me. They know me. So I, I go to the office. I'm talking to this lady. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we work with, with his wife. Yeah, he's legit. Day of closing, $12,000. We got $12,000 from a realtor to help us with this money. But God. Came down time for them to give us our interest rate. This is the time when interest rates were so high, 5%. We got a code for our, our interest rate, 4.2%. 4.2%. Well, guess what? God was not done with us. Because the guy working, the loan officer was working on another loan. He switched the loans, and then he gives us a, a lower interest rate, 3.9%. I called his office. They're like, well, the guy was working on another loan. He made a mistake. But since he made a mistake, we're going to honor it. 3.9%. But God, we get to the point of closing. At this point, we've done everything we can. We've tried to, like, cut our bu budget. We've tried to save what we can save. God has brought all this money that, you know, we were not expecting our way. And then we get to that point. We're broke. We have nothing. And we need money. I mean, obviously, a new house. You're going to need money to, you know, like, blinds, furniture, all of that stuff. Mortgage processor calls me and he's like, hey, we want to do something for you guys. And I'm just going through your loan uh, documents. So on the day of closing, we're going to give you guys $4,200 for your new house. <laughs> See, I was making $20 an hour at the time. $20 an hour is not supposed to buy a house in Ashburn. $20 an hour is not supposed to buy a brand new construction house in Ashburn. See, when I checked, when we went for closing, a house that we bought for $560,000 came in, the appraisal came in at $600,000. See, this is what God is able to do. Because when my coworkers look at me, they could not understand. We know how much you make. The math just does not add up. There's something wrong somewhere. It's either you have some inheritance. Um, your, your, your wife makes a lot of money. At the time, she was still a student. She was going to school. She had just graduated nursing school. So nothing made sense. But then God had to bring me through that process where I was being made fun of at work, where all these people were gathering against me because he needed to set a table before me in the presence of my enemies. When people were getting promoted, when people were getting all these things because they had connections to the right people, guess what? I had the connection to the only one that mattered. I had connection to my father who owns everything. I had the connection to the God of all the universe. And so he is the God. I mean, till this day, every time I get to my house and I put in the key, I pinch myself. How? How? I don't belong here. I look around. I walk through the neighborhood. I don't belong here. But God. But God. Yet though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. They rod and they stop, they come from me.
Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointed my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely. Surely. Not maybe. Not maybe. He said, surely. Surely. Your storm may not make sense. The things that you're going through right now, it may not make sense. But surely. Surely. Your child may have gone wayward and it may not have made sense. But surely. Surely. Your finances may look all like tattered and you're like, God, how is this going to work out? But surely. He is the God of the universe. He said, I am the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Is there anything too hard for me? Surely. I sit there at the NIH and I get together and I look around and everybody has a PhD. But God. Single mother, five kids, barely any education, middle school, could barely speak English. But God. The battle is not yours. This is not your battle. It's the Lord's. It's the Lord's. He is the Lord of hosts. Trust him in this process. Trust him through the storms. Because when the storms of life is raging and you try to fight this battle on your own, you will get overwhelmed. Because this is not your battle to fight. This is God's battle to fight. He is the I am that I am. When he opens the door, no man can shut it. When he opens that door for you, when that job comes, it's going to be specifically made for you. It's going to be tailor-made for you because he is the God of the universe. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 9 and 10. And he said, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in your weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with my weakness, with insult, with distress, with persecution, with difficulties. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, for when I am weak, for when I cannot no longer go on, for when I've given up all hope, for when everything is gone, when I've been stripped of everything, when I have no hope for my family, when there's no hope for my job, then he is strong. When all hope is gone, because God wants to bring us to that point where we cannot take glory for this. Well, we cannot take credit for what he's going to bring us to. So, but when I am weak, then he's strong. Because God cannot be strong with you, being strong also. It does not work that way. But when you are weak, then he's strong. I challenge you not to give up in that storm. Because the Lord will bring you through that storm. It will not overwhelm you. Because the Bible declares that he... That dwelleth, I mean dwelleth means he that is planted. I've been planted in the presence of the Lord. If I can only behold and gaze at the beauty of Jesus, if I can only know that my place is in the presence of the Lord, he said a thousand shall fall on thy side and ten thousand on thy right hand, but only with your eye would you behold the reward of the wicked. See, if the enemy knew that crucifying Jesus on the cross of Calvary will result in the redemption of my kind. He would not have done it. He said, I am done with him. He said, I am done with this guy. Now I become the ruler of this world. But you see, Satan can be the ruler of this world. But my God, he's the ruler of the universe.
Because the Bible says that the earth is the Lord's. See, it's, it is his. See, when something belongs to you, you don't have to stress over it. It is yours. See, the enemy was trying to take something that does not belong to him. And so he tries to kill Jesus. He tries to crucify him. They spat on him. They put him on the cross. And then he died physically. But in that death was so that he would die the physical death. But then out of that will resurrect the resurrection power. Out of that will come out the resurrection power. The power that took us from being Gentiles. The power that took us from being nobodies. The power that transformed us. The power that gave us grace to come near, to be grafted into the fold. And so if the enemy only understood that the things that he's bringing against the family, the storms that he's, he's bringing your way, the attacks that he's bringing your way, God will use that to bring a testimony. All things. I don't care what those things are. You're like, Sam, you don't understand. There's been a lot of craziness that has gone on. But he said all things, not some things, not the good things. The good, the bad, the ugly, everything, everything. I don't care what it is. Even if it's failure, you failed. You're like, Sam, I failed. I've messed up. He said all things, all things. Because God does not waste our pain. God does not waste our struggles. He takes the things that we go through. He sharpens us. He builds character. He molds us into the ones, the people that he wants. And then out of nothing, out of nothingness, something good comes out. See, they asked the questions back in the days. Can any good thing come out of this? Can any good thing come out of natural? Can any good thing come out of there? People ask you, look, amongst all your household, you're the least of them. Back in your country or whatever, back in your, in, in whatever, it's like, you're the least of them. And people have asked, can any good thing come out of this family? But God. He takes the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. God is the one who takes the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And so this morning, I want to challenge all of us. That in the midst of the storm, we remain faithful. That in the midst of the storm, we hold on to the word of God. That in the midst of the storm, we speak for this word. Because no weapon fashioned against you will prosper. And every tongue that will rise against you in judgment will be condemned. Because this is the heritage of the sons of God. You're not going to win by running away. You're not going to win by turning to the world. You're not going to win this battle by trying to fight it on your own. You're not going to win by compromising. Because you know what? If I can be like them, then maybe... I can get what they have. If I can change who I am, if I can go back on what the Lord wants me to do, then maybe, maybe, but that's not what God wants you to do. You hold steadfast in that moment. You still remain faithful. You still go to work, put on a smile. You still go to work and be the best worker you can be. Because that day when I was leaving, I went to my boss and I said, thank God for your life because you had to put that hindrance so God will give me another strategy. I said, I came in here making $19, $20 an hour, but I have a house. I have, I'm doing my master's. And then now I have this, this, uh, this thing at the NIH. I said, it had to take you putting those walls in my face. It had to take you putting those stumbling blocks. But I thank God that God had to use you. God had to use Pharaoh to rescue the Israelites. And so I thank God for you. I thank God for you. Because in the midst of the storm, if you will only remain faithful, in the midst of, that, of your battle, if you will remain faithful, you don't compromise on who you are. You'll be like Daniel, that I will not defile my garments with a king's meat. I will not defile my garments. If God can see that we will not defile our garments, if God will, can see that in the midst of it, our trust will still be in him. Our trust will still be in Yahweh. It will not be in our money. It will not be in anything that we have, but it's going to be in the Lord. Let's be on our feet.
I can have the worship team up. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I know some of you are going through things and you're battling things, but it is the Lord's battle. I don't know what you're going through, but the Lord will bring you through this. It is not over until he says it's over. I don't care what words have been spoken over you. The only word that matters is the word that the Lord spoke over you. There's no lie that he will not turn down. No shadow that he will not light up. There's no wall that he's not going to kick down for you. Now for the next minute, I just want you to raise up your voice and say, Father, I, I bring everything to you. This is not my battle to fight. Oh, Jesus. God, this is your battle, Jesus. This is your battle. It's not our battle to fight. Father, this is not our battle to fight. This is yours. Uh, you said, take my yoke. My yoke is lighter. Give me your yoke. Your burden. Give me everything. Lay it on the altar. Father, we lay everything on the altar. Our weaknesses, Lord. Our storms. Our struggles, our fears, Lord. Cast your fears on the Lord. We lay our burdens on you, Jesus. The storm may not make sense, but we know the Father, you will bring us through the storms. Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? Father, we've come this morning to anchor ourselves to you, Jesus. We've come this morning to anchor ourselves to you, Jesus. Yet though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Yet though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. If you want to come up and be just like be on the altar and be like, God, I want to just give you everything. You're free. Whatever. The Lord is leading you out. You to just come on the altar and just lay everything on the altar. Feel free. I feel the presence of the